A woman is free tonight after spending part of the weekend in jail for an unusual and painful crime. She's accused of slicing the penis of an 18-year-old man with a box cutter. He'd ripped my family apart. That's what he'd done. I had taken the law into my own hands. I had done that. February 1996. An ex-cop from Brooklyn, Robert Selman, was shot dead by the father of a female officer he was accused of stalking. But 15 minutes later, this heroic father met his end in a twist shrouded in mystery. An instant karma. Here are 10 parents who brutally avenged their kids' masters. Number 10. Marianne Bachmeyer March 6, 1981, 10 a.m. During the third day of the trial for the murder of Anna Bachmeyer, who had been raped and strangled, the accused perpetrator, Klaus Grabowski, a convicted sex offender who had previously confessed to the crime, sat in the courtroom awaiting his sentencing. In a shocking turn of events, Marianne, Anna's mother, approached him from behind. She grabbed a 22 cal Beretta from her large coat pocket, aimed it right at his back, and pulled that trigger eight times. Six shots found their mark, resulting in this man's instant death right there in the courtroom. Now, a few years before this, Marianne was a victim of rape herself. She had her first child at the age of 16. However, she put it up for adoption, being that she wasn't capable of raising a child at that moment. She got pregnant a second time by her then boyfriend. But shortly before the child was born, Marianne was brutally raped. At the same time, she gave the child up for adoption. In 1972, she became pregnant for a third time, but now she decided to keep the child. It was Anna. And immediately when Anna was old enough, Marianne would take her along to work at a pub. Now maybe, just maybe, if Marianne hadn't taken her to work there, Anna's life maybe wouldn't have ended the way it did. May 5th, 1980. Anna had an argument with her mother and decided to skip school. Coincidentally, this was the day she visited Klaus Grabowski, a 35-year-old butcher she made friends with while working at that pub. Out of probably boredom, she went over to his house to play with his cats. And in a twist of fate, Grabowski held her down, sexually assaulting her, and would ultimately strangle her with a pair of his fiancé's pantyhose. If that wasn't bad enough, he tied her up and packed her into this box which he left on the shore of this canal. A few hours later, when Marianne reported her daughter missing, Grabowski's fiancé turned him over to the police. When he was arrested, he said that he never intended to kill her. He only did so after the fact she threatened to report what he had done to her mother. To Marianne, that piece of information was worthless. All she wanted to do was take the man who took her only source of happiness and bury him six feet underground. I did it for you, Anna. Those were the words that came out of her mouth as she was apprehended and taken out of the courtroom for shooting Grabowski dead. On the other hand, this incident sparked this worldwide controversy. The media houses flew in from around the world reporting on the case. Some citizens sent support, gifts and flowers, indicating their understanding of her situation. Nonetheless, there were other people feeling Marianne should face the full wrath of the law for practicing vigilante justice. On March 2, 1983, she was convicted of manslaughter and unlawful possession of a firearm, and as a consequence, she received a six-year prison sentence, ultimately serving only three years. Upon her release, she got married again, relocated to Africa, where she intended to live out the remainder of her days. Unfortunately, after her passing at the age of 46, the debate remains ongoing about whether she deserved her time behind bars. This controversy persisted, especially in light of the apparent neglect by the German government in the case of Grabowski, a two-time convicted child molester who was allowed to spend minimal time in prison. Number 9. Jason Browning This is not CGI or makeup. That's the actual face of Raymond Frolander after he almost gotten beat to death by Jason Browning for sexually molesting his son. I just walked in and found a clone man molesting and I got him in a bloody puddle for you right now, officer. That was the 911 call made in July 2014, when Jason walked into his son's room to find him lying next to Raymond, who had his private sticking out of his boxer shorts. Frolander was a family friend and trusted to babysit the boy. He also lived within the neighborhood, 
However, on that day, Jason stepped out momentarily to get some food. His son was in the room playing video games along with Frolander and a few of his other friends. But once they left, Frolander would begin molesting the boy. When Jason returned, he heard a strange noise coming from his son's bedroom. Upon opening that door, he found Frolander with his pants down, assaulting his son. This fueled him with rage, leading him to unload punches and kicks that separated Frolander's consciousness from his body. He then called the cops, and by the time they arrived, Frolander was arrested, but also, they refused to press charges against Jason. Why, you ask? Well, because they believed he did what any father should have done. After his wounds were treated, Frolander admitted to molesting Jason's son for three years. Eventually, he pled no contest to lewd and lascivious molestation, a crime punishable by up to life in prison. However, the judge would give him 25 years as part of a plea deal. In addition, Frolander agreed to be listed as a sexual predator, undergo defender probation, and be electronically monitored for the rest of his life. Number 8. Bonita Lynn Vela This is 35-year-old Bonita Vela. She's accused of slicing the penis of an 18-year-old man with a box cutter. Your life or your manhood? That's the question Bonita Vela asked this man accused of m***ing her son before proceeding to cut off his jowls using a box cutter. Coincidentally, the same man was her daughter's boyfriend. December 28, 2013. 35-year-old Bonita Lynn Vela of Franklin, Indiana, smoked pot and instructed her daughter to invite her boyfriend to the family's trailer. Bonita was suspicious of the fact that her daughter's boyfriend had sexually assaulted her son. When the boy arrived, Bonita and two other accomplices took the boy into a trailer and held him down for three and a half hours, threatening him for the alleged crime. At first, Bonita contemplated tying him to a tree, shooting him in the head and leaving his body for those wild animals to feast on. However, she changed her mind and decided to give him a lesser punishment. She forced this man to drop his pants and told him that she'll allow him to live if he allowed her to cut off his manhood. According to his story, Bonita aimed to leave him with a permanent reminder of the harm he caused her son. She took out a fork and stabbed his manhood repeatedly. And as she saw it wasn't doing that much damage, she would take a box cutter from that trailer and sliced deep into his skin. It would be now that she would ask him the horrendous question, but since he couldn't provide an answer, she let go, pushing him out of that trailer and into the cold night as he bled to the nearest hospital. Now, there are a few things particularly wrong with this story, but the most disturbing of all is the fact that Bonita never provided any evidence that this man actually assaulted her son. She claimed to have gotten the idea that he did right after smoking pot and couldn't confirm nor deny if she had taken any other drugs that day. On the other hand, this man denied ever committing such an act. It left the cops in this dilemma of who was right and wrong. Now, this man wasn't charged with any crime. Bonita, though, was given aggravated assault and handed a 16-month sentence. She'd be at home for 10 months on a GPS monitor and 6 months on probation. Number 7. Sarah Sands this is 32-year-old Sarah Sands. In a few moments' time, she will stab a man to death with a knife that she is carrying underneath her clothing. Mothers are the unsung heroes of our time. However, when Sarah here played hero by murdering the monster of her three children, she paid a price she didn't even expect. In 2014, Sarah left her East London apartment with a hood pulled over her head while armed with a knife. She walked to a neighboring block of flats and down to the home of 77-year-old Michael Pleestead. Pleestead had 24 previous convictions of sex offenses over three decades, and at the time of his encounter with Sarah, he was facing fresh charges of sexually assaulting a minor. For some reason, no one really knew Pleestead's background till the incident with Sarah happened. He was a high-profile character in the neighborhood often perched on a seat outside his home, giving him contact with local residents and their children. Along the line, police had invited Sarah's eldest son, Brad, to come over to his house and help him sort out some newspapers. Sarah had no problem with this, seeing many kids work in police Dead's house over the weekend. This made Sarah consent to Brad going over. But what she didn't know here is that these kids were being manipulated by police Dead to satisfy his sadistic desires. 
After giving her eldest Brad, police did us and her twin boys as well. The worst part is he did this for months until the boys summoned up the courage to open up to their mother. At first, Sarah did the right thing by reporting him to the cops. He was subsequently arrested and charged with offenses against her sons. However, while awaiting trial, the judge granted him bail and said he could return to the estate. That act by the judge made Sarah furious and devastated at the same time. She couldn't comprehend the fact that Pleasted would be allowed to return to the same neighborhood where he blatantly molested dozens of kids without any remorse. So upon his return, she took her sons to stay with her mom while she came up with the plan of ending his life. I think I had a knife in my left hand and I remember him trying to grab it. I had taken the law into my own hands. I had done that. On the night of the attack, she was caught by CCTV going towards Pleasted's flat. According to her story, she said she wanted to ask him to plead guilty to those charges and spare her boys the ordeal of going to court. But she wouldn't have carried a knife if that's all she wanted to do, now would she? I don't know what I was doing there. I realized I had made a huge mistake. He wasn't remorseful in any shape or form. He said your children are lying. The whole world froze. I had the knife in my left hand, and I remember he tried to grab it. After a little kerfuffle, Sarah mercilessly stabbed police did eight times, leaving him to bleed out right there in his home. A few hours later, she took herself into the police station with her blood-stained knife and clothing. Consequently, she was convicted of manslaughter rather than murder, on the grounds she had lost control. She was jailed for three and a half years, but later saw the sentence increased to seven and a half years because it was ruled to be too lenient. Authorities claim that if she truly didn't intend to kill him, she should have called the emergency services right after she lost control. She spent four years in prison and was released on parole. When asked if she felt remorse for what she did, she said, Why did you feel remorse? I bring life into the world. <laughs> it never occurred to me that I would be guilty of taking life out of the world. Number 6. Andre Bumbersky Now this story is the most bone-chilling out of all the others we've talked about so far. So brace yourself, because the ending will have you picking up your jaw. July 9th, 1982. A girl named Kalinka Bobersky was spending the evening with her mother and German stepdad, Dieter Krumbach, at their family home in Lindau, Germany. After having dinner that evening, Mr. Krumbach injected Kalinka with cobalt ferlicet, a cobalt iron preparation he liked to use on many family members and friends. He claimed it was to cure anemia, but by the time he woke up the next morning, Kalinka was dead. And that's when the real story began. Two days later, this autopsy was conducted, but what they found would be more disturbing than anyone had imagined. The cause of death wasn't found, but they did find aspirated stomach contents in her airway and lungs, several injection marks, fresh blood stains around her genitals, and a whitish substance on the surface of her genitals. The substance wasn't tested, and her privates were immediately cut off. It looked like someone was trying to cover up a murder, and all fingers were pointing at Mr. Krumbach, her stepfather. Now that was coupled with the fact that he kept changing his story about what he injected into her body that night. Her biological father, Andre Bumbersky, who was in France at the time, immediately ordered some fresh investigations into his daughter's death. However, it didn't go anywhere. Unwilling to give up, Bumbersky distributed leaflets in Lindau, accusing Krumbach of and murdering his daughter. Krumbach sued for defamation, asking to pay about 500,000 euros, which Bumbersky refused to pay. The whole thing got a bit messy, and in the end, there wouldn't be any substantial evidence proving Krumbach's injection negligently or intentionally caused this girl's death. Bumbersky had already lost his wife to Krumbach. He wasn't about to sit back and let this guy get away with his daughter's murder. So, he did the unthinkable. October 17, 2009, after 27 years of seeking justice for his daughter's killer, Bumbersky sent three men to abduct and drive Krumbach down to France to face charges. This was because Germany refused to extradite Krumbach, so Bumbersky had to do it himself. Meanwhile, Krumbach, who's now 74 at this time, suffered a fractured skull while in transit 
and they tied him to a police station for French cops to arrest him. The news of what Bombersky did came to light, and he was also arrested and jailed for orchestrating a kidnap. A fresh trial was opened two years later, with multiple women testifying that Krumbach had sexually abused them as teenagers, always using cobalt iron injections. October 22, 2011, after 30 years of fighting for justice, Andre Bombersky finally saw Krumbach get sentenced to 15 years in prison for causing intentional bodily harm, resulting in unintentional death. The prosecutors believed he drugged Kalinka to rubber. And our story keeps on going. Germany demanded Bombersky be extradited to stand trial for Krumbach's abduction, but it was rejected. Subsequently, he was trialed in France and handed a one-year suspended jail sentence after pleading guilty. Number 5. Gary Ploche March 16, 1984. Gary Ploche shot and killed the man who had kidnapped, sodomized, and molested his son, Jody. The events that led to this brutal incident began when Jody started taking karate with a 25-year-old instructor named Jeffrey Doucet. What this poor boy's parents didn't know is this evil man Jeffrey had been sexually abusing his son for at least a year. The boy always made up excuses to miss his karate classes. However, like any other parent, Gary thought Jody was just being lazy and kept forcing him to go. Until Jody's coach did the craziest thing any pedophile could ever do. February 14, 1984, Jeffrey abducted Jody after their karate class, took him on a bus heading from Port Arthur, Texas, bound for LA, and lodged him into a motel in Anaheim, California, where he took advantage of him. Jody was gone for 10 days, becoming the focus of a nationwide search. Jeffrey knew instantly that he had gone way too far, so he allowed Jody to speak with his mom, letting her know that he was still alive. Now the cops were able to pin that cell tower where the call came from and found the motel where Jeffrey was holding the boy. Less than a week later, California police raided that motel, arresting Jeffrey, and immediately took Jody back home to his parents. And this would be the beginning of another story. News reports went wild, stating that Jody was molested and assaulted with a broomstick. You can just imagine how Gary felt at that point, so he decided to enact justice himself. March 16, 1984, Doucet was flown back to Louisiana to face trial. He arrived at Baton Rouge Metropolitan Airport and was led in handcuffs by police officers at around 9.30 p.m., while Gary was waiting patiently with a revolver. An employee of the local ABC affiliate WBRZ-TV had told Gary when Jeffrey would be arriving at that airport and had set up their cameras to record his arrival. Opposite the news crew was a bank of payphones, where Gary waited while talking to his best friend on the phone. As a disguise, he wore the classic baseball cap and sunglasses. And as Jeffrey was escorted through that airport, he passed by the news crew taping the scene and then walked past Gary Ploche who took out his handgun and fired at the right side of Jeffrey's head at point-blank range. Jeffrey immediately dropped, bleeding from a wound close to his right ear. He was pronounced dead at the scene. As for Gary, he was given a seven-year suspended sentence, with five years probation and 300 hours of community service, which he completed in 1989. Subsequently, he passed away in 2014, after suffering a stroke three weeks after his 69th birthday. To this day, many people say he should have been charged with murder. Others say he was in the right, because men like Jeffrey deserve nothing better than death. Number 4. Eduardo Gallo July 2000, a 25-year-old girl named Paula Gallo was chilling with her friends at her parents' weekend home. But out of nowhere, a group of attackers would storm the house, making out with a ton of jewelry, a couple of parked cars, and abducted Paula. A few days later, Eduardo received a call from these attackers demanding a hefty amount of 18,500, which is equivalent to 3 million Mexican pesos, in exchange for his daughter. It might have seemed outrageous, but the kidnappers knew the Gallo family was probably well off, thus trying to milk them for extra millions. Mr. Gallo wasted no time in paying this ransom, but as you might have guessed, he didn't hear from the kidnappers, nor did he see his daughter. After a week, three suspects were arrested in connection with this case. 
The body of his daughter was found close to the location the ransom was dropped off. What was even more shocking was that a huge chunk of that ransom was found beside her body untouched. She was shot twice, in the neck and the back. After Eduardo reported the case to the police, three suspects were arrested but none of them were the killers. And for some reason, the police refused to dig into this case. Also, the clothing she wore vanished, and the cops lied about there being any fingerprint traces at the house where she was abducted. At this point, Eduardo knew there was something fishy, and there was no way his daughter's killers were going to be found, unless he took the law into his own hands. So he shut down his entire consulting firm and took up the role of an amateur detective. He tried collaborating with police, but as far as they were concerned, his daughter's case was solved. Eduardo decided to bend a few rules by using his connections. He was able to get classified data on call logs, location, and house details of the three men arrested for his daughter's murder. And suddenly, he had a lead. He found a number of random payphones around the area that kept trying to contact one of the suspects. This payphone was traced to a town named Toltitlan in the state of Mexico. When Eduardo showed this evidence, the cops were obviously surprised and had no choice but to go with this intel. They would triangulate the location of that payphone and capture a 28-year-old man, Francisco Zamora Arellano, who would eventually confess to killing Paula. Now, the big takeaway from this story is that it took Eduardo a whole year to actually crack down this murder case, the same case the Mexican police had ruled over. Number 3. Barry Laprell Gilton and Lupe Mercado What would you do if you saw your daughter get abducted by this evil person and no one was willing to help get her back? You go to the police, you even go to child services, and none of them are doing anything about it. The worst part is, you know where your abductor lives, and you hear she's being trafficked for sexual exploitation. While we let you ponder this, that was the exact situation Barry and Lupe found themselves in after their daughter was abducted back in 2012. You see, Barry and Lupe started dating back in high school, staying together for a couple of years. They never officially got married, but they did have four children, three boys and a girl. The name of the girl has been kept a secret to protect her identity, but the family lived in San Francisco, California. At around the time their daughter was 17 years old, Barry and Lupe noticed some changes in her behavior. First, she began staying out late. Then she would come back home and lock herself indoors. This would force her parents to break into her privacy a little, where they saw what I call every parent's nightmare. By logging onto that computer, they found her selling herself online as an escort through Twitter and online ads. When the young girl came home that night, her parents confronted her about what they'd seen and decided to send her to her uncle's place in LA. Now, this wouldn't solve the problem, but only make it worse. When she got to LA, she met 22-year-old pimp Calvin Sneed. Sneed would manipulate this young girl into becoming a roadside call girl and would take most of the money she was making. Her uncle told her parents about her late-night shenanigans, which in turn her parents reported to the police. But the police couldn't care less about this because there wasn't enough evidence available to arrest Sneed. This would be the moment her parents decided to take things into their own hands. May 27, 2012, Barry and Lupe stationed themselves along Vinland Avenue in North Hollywood, waiting for Sneed to pass by as this was his usual route when trafficking their daughter. Probably feeling like a modern-day Bonnie and Clyde, they had that gun with them and were ready to kill Sneed. At the end of the day, these two weren't criminals. So when Sneed actually showed up at this location, Barry took out his 9mm and fired some shots, missing terribly. Sneed was injured and had no idea it was the girl's parents who were after him. If he did, he wouldn't have made the grave mistake he made next. June 2nd, 2012, Sneed and the couple's daughter returned to San Francisco to visit Sneed's ailing family member. Since her parents' house wasn't too far away, she went to visit him to let him know she was around but would be staying with Sneed and his family in the area. It was the perfect opportunity to strike again. So the couple grabbed another gun, tracing their daughter down to Sneed's apartment. Once they knew that location, they came back on the 4th of July to carry out this assassination 
like a scene straight from your favorite action movie. The mother waited down the street, watching when Sneed would leave his apartment. At around 1.57 a.m., she called Barry to give the signal, and at 2 a.m. sharp, Barry drove by with a gray Mercedes-Benz SUV and viciously shot Sneed dead right in front of the apartment. When the shots rang out and their daughter saw the dead body, she called the cops on him, and the couple was arrested. Now they're locked up on a $2 million bail bond and are yet to be convicted. On the other hand, close friends of the couple believe the entire case doesn't make any sense. These were the same people who were victims and had an open case with the police, yet now they're charged as murderers. Number 2. A Texan Father June 9th, 2012. A 23-year-old father was working on his horse and barbecuing before an onlooker hurriedly alerted him about the abduction of his daughter by 45-year-old Jesus Mota Flores. In Shiner, Flores forcibly carried this girl into a horse barn and took advantage of her. Shiner's a town of 2,000 people west of San Antonio. The area is really secluded, and if the onlooker hadn't spotted Flores, the girl's young father wouldn't have had a clue about what was about to happen to his daughter. The father heard his girl scream and ran into that direction. Once he got into that barn, he found Flores, hands down beside his child. That angered him to the point where he pulled Flores off her and went through with this brutal carnage, punching Flores' face unrecognizable. Someone called 911 to report this incident, and paramedics who responded found Flores' body lying in a pasture near the barn, his underwear down, and his head swollen. They performed CPR but couldn't detect a heartbeat. He was pronounced dead at the scene. An autopsy found that Flores died from blunt force head and neck injury, and the death was ruled a homicide. Now here's the good part. The father wasn't charged with any crime. Prosecutors believed he did what any father would do and as such, was set free. And number one, Paul Bender. February 1996, an ex-cop from Brooklyn, Robert Selman, was shot dead by the father of a female officer he was accused of stalking. In turn, the girl's father died in the most horrible way you can imagine. Now, a year before any of this happened, former officer Selman was going through a rough patch in his life. He was obsessed with a female cop in his precinct named Jill. Selman had made numerous advances towards Jill, but she just wasn't interested. At the same time, Selman wasn't the one to give up. His love for Jill turned into an obsession. On numerous occasions, he would ring up her phone with many unwanted calls. Other times, he would lurk around the windows of her home to get a glimpse of her. It was at this point his advances weren't just casual, but predatory. This led the Bender family to seek a restraining order against Selman, but it didn't stop him. December 1995, Robert Selman was involved in a ghastly car accident that totaled his car. In turn, he couldn't return to work for a few weeks. During this period, he broke the judge's instructions and persisted in stalking Jill, leaving the NYPD with no other choice than to fire him. It was at this point he had nothing to lose. He didn't get the girl he wanted, he didn't have a job, and he probably thought himself a loser. And it would be at this point that 60-year-old Paul Bender, Jill's father, felt that he needed to confront Selman to put an end to his stocking once and for all. Now, Bender was a retired City Department of Water employee, which gave him a permit to carry a gun. So, Mr. Bender would go over to Selman's home in this quiet Brooklyn community and fatally shoot him twice in the head. Bender would leave that house, walk around the corner towards his parked car, and collapse from an apparent heart attack minutes later. Yeah, you heard that right. He died of a heart attack minutes after killing Selman. Maybe he couldn't handle taking someone's life. We can't tell. But what we can say is that the emergency medical technicians pronounced Selman dead at the scene and rushed the stricken father to the hospital, where he also died. At first, Selman's neighbors thought he committed suicide. The only problem was there was no murder weapon in sight. Then Mr. Bender's body was found a few blocks away with a gun, but there was no bullet wound on his lifeless body. This prompted him to run ballistics on the weapon, confirming it was the same weapon used to murder Selman. And in turn, an autopsy revealed Bender died from a heart attack. <laughs> 